That's a good one. Praise God. Well, are y'all ready this morning? You want to get a re- fresh revelation from heaven today? Look at the person beside you and poke them, kind of push them around a little bit. And say, are you ready? This is not nap time, man. This is, this is not spec, 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 what am I looking for? Spec, spectator time. This is anticipator, participator time. Amen. So get your Bibles out. Now, before I get into this, because I'm going to forget it in just a second, let me just tell y'all, uh, for those of you that have our phone app, uh, if, you just, if you don't, you can go to the Waterhole, or go to your app store, and then just search the Waterhole, and you can come up with the app, and uh, we've done some redesign on it. If, you doesn't, if yours doesn't update, you may have to update your phone to get the new stuff, but uh, it's all there. Don't ask me how to do that. Find somebody young, figure it out. But you can do it. Amen. Um, and so go check that out. But go, turn in your Bibles, 2 Samuel 4.4. 4. That's where we started last week. I started a new series last week called Masterminds. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm just going to briefly go over it because you can go and you can listen to the broadcast. You can go to thewaterhole.net. You can see the video of last week's service. And you can listen to the message about what you missed because... Uh, I want to move into some other stuff today, and I'm the kind of preacher that if I start reviewing, I'm going to get, I'm just going to preach all of that, and then just get just a very little bit of new stuff today. So, anyway, we started last week talking about this guy named Meshibbeth out of Second Samuel four four, and he, you know, he was a young man. He was five years old. He was the son of Jonathan. He was. Uh, uh, his grandfather was Saul, and, and the kingdom had fallen. Saul had been killed. Jonathan had been killed. The nurse grabs him up. He's five years old, so he wasn't like he was a little baby. They took him out. Somehow or another, he fell. He got dropped, and he became lame in his feet. Don't know what happened to him. Might have broke his back. I don't know. Damaged himself somehow, and he was lame in his feet. So they go to this place. You can read the story on. You can find it in, in 2 Samuel 9. They, he, they, David's looking. He's now the king, and he's looking for somebody in the family of Saul to bless because he was in covenant with Jonathan, this kid's father, and he wanted to bless him. But, you know, in those days, whenever the royal family changed, they usually killed everybody in the line so that they didn't have to worry about somebody coming back. So Meshibbeth is hiding basically in fear that someday David might come and kill him. Well, all of a sudden he shows up. So David is living, I mean, Meshibbeth is living in a place called Lodabar. And if you go research the word and look up the word, Lodabar means no pastures. So we country folk around here know what that means. No pasture, it's either overgrazed or you're in a drought, right? And so it was a dry, dusty place. And so this is where he's living in a place where there's no life, there's no pastures, there's no, there's no, no fields, no joy, no peace. Everybody, y'all know, man, August in South Texas, nobody's happy, <laughs> right? Well, let's change it. September. Holy cow, I'm ready for the new, new the front to come in, you know, and drop these temperatures. But anyway, August in South Texas, man, it's hot, it's dry, it's dusty. Everybody's got a bad attitude. Well, this is where this kid lived, in the place of bad attitude. He lived in the place of, it was Lodabar, dusty, hot. All for one reason, because he got dropped in life, his lame in his feet. And I can guarantee the thoughts that went through his head every day were, David's going to kill me. I can't walk. I can't produce. I'm not profitable. I'm not any good. Look, you know, I'll never be anything because I'm lame in my feet. So David shows up and he says, look, I'm just looking to bless somebody from the house of, of Jonathan, the house of Saul. And they said, it's you. And so he said, who am I? I'm just a, like a dead dog. See, the attitude, the thoughts in his mind had already gotten him to the place where he only believed that he was a dead dog. He didn't believe that he was really a prince. And then what happens? David said, no, 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 I want you. He finds this guy named Ziba, and he says, Ziba, I want you to take care of everything for Meshibbeth, all of his family. I want you to do all the work. I want you to bless it. You work the fields. You take care of it. But he's sitting at my table. Hello? He said he's going to sit at the king's table, his rightful position, even though, even though Saul and his family line truly weren't the, 
the, the, the rightful heirs. David was the rightful king. But he said, you're going to sit at the table. You're going to be a prince. And I brought the point out last week that so many Christians are living in Lodabar. So many Christians are living saying, I'm just a dead dog. So many Christians are living, they, they know that they're saved. They know that they're going to go to heaven. They know that when they die, that they'll, they'll, they'll leave this body and go to heaven. But they're not walking in the promises. They're not walking in the, the, the benefits. They're not walking in the blessings of being children of God. And so this whole message is about being a mastermind to learn how the devil is tricking you, to learn how the enemy's coming into your mind and into your thoughts and getting you all thinking backwards and you not taking your rightful position at the table of the king. Amen. Everybody turn to the person side and say, I want to sit at the king's table. We forget who we are. It says in James 1.23, if anyone uh, hears these words and is not a doer, but is a man, is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. What happens is we're in this world. Folks, listen to me. If you go read the headlines of the news and you're going to think that the world's really going to go down the way the headlines of the news says, you're not going to get you, you're not going to stick your head out in the morning. I mean, they throw this thing up every once in a while that Yosemite is going to blow up and kill all of us. Have y'all seen that one? You know, Old Faithful going off. Uh, it, it, it's going to, what? Yellowstone, I'm sorry, not Yosemite. Yellowstone's going to blow up. It's going to be the super volcano. It's going to kill everybody. Well, why do we need to know that? If it is, it is. What are you going to do? Yeah. Right? What are you going to do? Build a bunker? So why don't they just shut up talking about it? Oh, one day, you see the headlines. Man, the unemployment has never been a 50-year low. It's everybody's doing great, but we're going to have a recession and everybody's going to die. Right? That's what, that, that's what the news is doing to you all the time. And you get that junk in your head and it rolls around inside your head all the time. Well, then, folks, you don't know what to do. Well, I want to tell you, I'm going to show you this morning, that's a tactic of the enemy to get you not to remember who you are, that you are a child of God, that you're born again, that you're washed in the blood of Jesus, that all the promises of God are yes and amen to you. It's all about trying to get you not to take your position at the king's table. It's all about you to get to the place where, you know, if you could just get a crumb that falls from the table. But that's not what God called you to do. He called you to be sons and daughters of God. He called us to take forth the kingdom that he's given us and then to expand it and enlarge it and bless all those people around us. Now, don't get your feelings hurt this morning. You know, I just like to, just like to preach it. I just like to just throw it out there. But I'm, I just would say, not in this, I'm not using just this church. I'm talking about the body of Christ this morning. Most Christians came to church this morning to try to get something from God. Most Christians did not come to church this morning to see what they could do for God. Because we're all in need. Because they're not walking in the promises. So we got it. we're all in need and we should be the people that are so blessed that we came to church to get charged up to hear the word of God, to go back out in the world today and to say, where's, where's somebody? Lord, where's my divine appointment today? Where is that person I'm supposed to lay hands on and see get healed? Where's that person I'm supposed to bless today? Oh, Lord, I got money burning a hole in my pocket. Who am I supposed to give it to? Instead of saying, oh, Lord, woe is me. Why haven't you done anything? Why haven't, Lord, I mean, I don't understand. I've been a good Christian. I've done this thing. I'm going to try to destroy those thoughts in your brains today. Okay. Once the devil gets you to forget who you are, but then he immediately starts planting seed in you. He starts planting little larva seeds that are going to produce little worms that are going to eat in your head and steal from you. The devil wants you to think that God's not going to work for you. His promises don't work. He wants you to think that, you know, because you've done something wrong or you haven't done enough or you, you, you didn't go to church enough or you didn't pray enough or you didn't do this. And right now, as I'm saying this, if, if that thought goes through your head, yeah, but pastor, you know, let me tell you what, you got some worms in there that need to be killed this morning. I'll just put you on the spot right now if you're saying, yeah, but you don't understand. You've got to, you know, I mean, you, 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 works is involved in this. I'm telling you, you've got some work worms in your head, and I'm going to get them out here in just a minute. I'm going to cast them out of you. I'm going to deworm you. <laughs> got some dewormer of the Holy Ghost. We're going to get them cast out of you, okay? I told y'all that I read this article that was talking about what everybody in the world wants. And I just had to go click on it because I'm like, what, are, what, are this, what is the world saying they want? 
And this is the 10 things. They want happiness. They want money. They want freedom. They want peace. They want joy. They want balance. They want fulfillment, confidence, stability, and passion. That's what they said in this big survey that the world wants. Well, the gospel offers all of that. A relationship with Jesus, walking in his, promise, in his promises, offers all of that. Amen. Joy, peace, happiness, fulfillment, stability. It offers all of that. But how many Christians do you know that look like they just got through, you know, sucking on a old lemon or something, you know, just draw it up. No joy, no peace. You wouldn't know them from the heathens. Hello? Come on. I'm just preaching truth this morning. I'm just preaching truth. Because 2 Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. He's given us all things that pertain to life. Anything you're going to run across, I don't care what it is. A flat tire on the road, he's given you all things that pertain to life. If you're living life, you're still alive on this earth, he's already given you all things that pertain to it. Now we all have some... We all have different lives and different things that happen in our lives, right? But he's already given you all things. He says, through the knowledge of him, through the knowledge of him that have called us to glory and virtue. You're called to glory, church. You're called to be, listen to me, I don't want to offend you, but if it offends you, you know, you got to love me and get over it. You're, you're called to be the person that everybody looks at and says, my, how, how in the world did they pull that off? They don't have enough sense to fight their way out of a paper sack. And look at them. They, they, they did that? How did that? Because the Bible says God wants to use the foolish things of the world to confound the wisdom of the wise. So he called you to glory. People are supposed to be looking at you and saying, man, that, you know, I know them. <laughs> That's got to be God in their life. That's what he's looking to do for you. He wants you to be called to glory, and so you can just stand there, and they say, how did that happen? How did you? I I just love Jesus, and I just worship him and praise him, and his promises are true to me, and the smartest decision ever made in life, and I gave my life to Jesus, and and, and I became his son, and I don't know. It just works. So we can be able to partake of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. He says there's a way of escape. You've been provided everything. There's a way of escape. You're supposed to walk in glory. It's all there for you, but I'm telling you, worms are stealing it from you. So let me just go. This is, this is something new. Okay, that was all the review. Philippians 4. It's a scripture you know. You're going to say, oh, I know that scripture. I know it by heart. But do you live it? Is it just one of those that we know? It's like the person that says, oh, I know my favorite scripture is John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes, but do you know God loves you? You may quote me the scripture, and that's good. But do you know what the revelation of the scripture is? Do you know that you're loved? Or is your love conditional with God? You know you're loved, but you only love you to do things right. So you know you were loved, but then, you know, you're living in this earthly mentality of an earthly father that if you didn't please him, he was mad at you. So you're put that over onto God Almighty and saying, well, I don't know if I please God. And so, you know, I didn't do good because I got mad at my husband and said he was a jerk and mumbered and grappled about him because he just doesn't ever pick up his clothes and he's just, you know, slob and why did I get married to this pig? And so, Lord, how could you love me? Because you know this is what I thought. And so that worm's in your head. And so, so you're trying to, you, you're, you're going to pray for something. You're going to pray for something. And you're saying, oh, Lord, I just think you're going to help me get the bills paid this week. We're going to get the whole electricity bill paid. And then a little worm comes in your head. Well, that's not going to work because you said your husband's a jerk. And he didn't pick up his clothes. He's a sorry, no good for nothing. Well, I guess you're right. You know, you don't really love me. Stole the promise right from you. Stole it from you. Why? Because a worm was in your head because you believed a lie. Says right here, finally, my brethren, Paul speaking here to the church at Philippi, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report. If there's anything, any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, 
Meditate on these. Now, let me ask you a question, church. In your daily meditations, I'm not talking about when you're praying. I'm not talking about in the morning when you're trying to have a Bible study. I'm not talking about when you went to the Bible study with all your friends. I'm talking about the meditative thoughts that went through your mind on a daily basis. Do they fall into that category? Or do they fall into the category of, why is everything so hard? We're never going to make it. How come everybody that surrounds me is an idiot? Why is it always an uphill battle? Why is this happening to me? Are any of those thoughts praiseworthy? But you don't have to look down at the floor, don't have to raise your hand. But how many of you have those thoughts? None of us are immune. None of us are immune. But Paul says, look, if you want to walk in the things of God, you're going to to set your meditations on praiseworthy, noteworthy, pure uh, things that are true. That's what you're going to set your mind on. And he says, and if you do these, then the God of peace will be with you. The God of peace will be with you. So what you're thinking about is controlling, listen, your altitude. No, excuse me, your attitude, your altitude and your direction. How high you're going to sell with God is going to be determined on simply this one thing. What do you think? Listen, your battle is not the unlovely people in the world. Your battle is not taking offense with the unlovely people in the world and letting that worm get in your head. It just got deathly quiet when I said that. It was like somebody sucked the air out of this room when I said that. Y'all just went, I mean, it scared me there for a minute. I was checking, saying, are you okay? It's the truth. Because I want to tell you something, folks. You're never going to get rid of the unlovely people. You're never going to get to a place in life. If you went, listen to me, if you went out to Terlingua and you dug you a hole, and you buried yourself in there, okay? Made you an underground bunker. Put, you know, wire, Constantina wire all around you. Mined the field around you. Did everything you could to keep people away from you. You know what would happen? There'd be a rat <laughs> come in your and, that little bunker and start eating some of your stuff, and then you'd be mad at the rat. And then when you kill, finally kill the rat, then the snake that was going to eat the rat, he came in there and you'd have, it would just be a constant thing. And then four long fleas would get in there on you. <laughs> You're never going to get away from issues and probably live in a, a fallen world. There's always going to just get it out of your head. It's not ever, you're not living in candy land. There's always going to be issues and problems, but what are you going to do about it? If you let the worms get in your head, you're going to be defeated. Because you're not going to be thinking on the things that are setting your altitude with Jesus. You're thinking of the things that keep you bound to this earth. 2 Corinthians 4.3 But even if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled by those that are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. That's what he's doing to you, folks. Listen. He's got you, you, you committed your life to Jesus. And I'm talking to Christians this morning. Listen to me. If you're not a Christian, if you're not born again, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you happen to come across this video and you're listening to me right now, listen, you need to stop right now and you need to ask Jesus to come into your life because you don't stand a chance without Jesus of defeating the thoughts in your brain. That's the truth. But you, I'm speaking to this, the church here, I'm speaking to born again Christians. I'm speaking to people who are in just a minute going to come up here and have communion. The devil wants to blind your mind. He wants to blind the things that you're seeing. He wants you to get so bound up and caught up that you keep yourself bound to this world by the thoughts that are going through your head. Depending on how deep the hurts, depending on how deep the pains, you may get over you know, the, the, some of the, the, the horrible things that happen in life, and they do, and I'm not, t- I'm not belittling it. 
But listen to me. I'm not telling you you just quit thinking about it. I'm telling you, I'm going to show you in just a minute how you got to deal with it. But listen to me. It's the devil's trick, tactic, to keep you bound to this world. And as long as you're bound to this world, you're never going to find victory. You're going to be caught up, angry, hurt, disappointed all the time. Because 2 Corinthians 4.18 gives us another truth. It says, while we do not look at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. Listen to me. Listen to me. The things in this world are going to go away. What politician cheated who is not going to be in heaven. Are you with me? We're not taking Democrats and Republicans to heaven. Right? But the things that you're learning now on this earth, what I'm going to teach you today, what the scriptures are saying, the truth, opening up and say, ah, I understand how the enemy's tricking me, getting that revelation that you're going to take with you forever. And the, the key to this scripture is you can't keep looking at the things that are seen. If you keep looking at the things that are seen, you keep trying to figure out why the world is like the world is and why did so-and-so do this and what if and this and that, you keep playing all those games, you're binding yourself to this earth and the way it thinks. You're keeping yourself bound up and you're not going to get right. Listen, as soon as all of this presidency goes by and whatever happens in 2020, whatever happens as politicians, listen to me, five more years, it'll be, it'll be the same thing. Just be a different person. Nothing's going to change. Why? Because we live in a corrupt world. One person is going to be trying to find dirt on another person to make the other person look bad so that they don't see the dirt on him so that he doesn't get exposed. That's what happens. That's what they do. Don't find it odd and say, oh, the world's so terrible. Listen, there's been some horrible, horrible things go on. Horrible things go on in this world that happened in 1000 A.D., Okay, so we got to set our mind on the things above. We got to get to the place in life where we want to think like Jesus. We want the mind of Christ. We want to think like he thinks. We want to understand like he thinks. You say, oh, that's just too much. I don't think. We well, can start somewhere. Hello? Okay, so the Bible talks about in 1 Peter 5, 8 through 9, it says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, Seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. That's what the Bible says. Your answer to dealing with the devil is to resist him. Now, again, I'm saying some things this morning that could be hitting you right between the eyes and you don't like it. But I'm just asking you to love me. Grab hold of the truth. It doesn't say that you're supposed to Cast the devil into swine. It doesn't say you're supposed to cast the devil into, the, into hell. You're supposed to have this big fight. I always get so mad. It makes me so angry. I've never watched, I don't watch scary movies. I don't watch horror movies. I've I got enough things. You, when you live in the country and you're out at dark at night, you don't watch horror. You don't want any thought to be coming into your mind, right? Why do I want to see that stuff? There ain't no way. All right? And I learned that as a kid. I never watched horror movies as a kid, stuff like that. You know, I'm not going to watch no psycho movie, The Killer, Somebody's in the Dark. Forget that stuff, man. I got enough to deal with in my head. Besides the fact it's not godly, not producing truth, but I'm just saying you just don't do that when you live in the country. But it doesn't say that you're supposed to, you know, you always see in the movies, they always have the, the devil comes in and he, you know, he, he kills the priest and throws him out the window or something. I'm always like, why does the good guy lose? I mean, the truth of the matter is, Jesus is already victorious over the devil. He is defeated, right? And our job is what it says right here. Resist him. Just don't give him any place. Say, shut up. How do you resist somebody? Shut up. You don't be around them. You don't hang around them. You don't, it's just, I mean, you're going to resist them? It means you're not having coffee with him and having any communion. Right? It doesn't mean you have to go to war. Resisting doesn't mean you have to go to war and call fire down from heaven upon it. It just means you don't have anything to do with him. He comes up and talks to you and says, shut up and get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. That's resisting. Am I right? I don't want to. I'm not trying to belittle anything. I'm just saying this is the way he says to do it. Resisting. 
So all you've got to do is be willing today to put up some resistance. Not just say, oh, you're right, oh gosh, I'm never going to make it. That's not resisting. The devil comes to you and says, oh, your future looks bad. Everything bad's going to happen to you. You're never going to be here. You go, oh, it is. I know it. Oh, God. You didn't resist. Resist to say, oh, shut up. That's not true. The Bible says I'm blessed. Everything that I touch is blessed. Everything I put my hand to is going to prosper. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to hell anyway. I ain't going to talk to you. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. That would be resisting. Again, another scripture here, Matthew 6, 25. He says, take no thought. King James, I love the way the King James translates this, because he says, take no thought for your life, what you should lead or drink. Take no thought. You've got to control, control your thoughts. And in controlling your thoughts, that's how you resist the enemy. So now let me get to the message. Go to 2 Timothy 1.7. This is the message. I'm going to show you how to cast the worms out of your head. I'm going to show you how to resist the devil. All right? Second Timothy 1 7. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. The very first thing I want you to understand here this morning, and where I'm going with this, is I want to show you fear versus faith. Okay? The enemy wants to come into you, and he wants to implant in you a thought of fear. The other day I was, I was talking with someone, and they were telling me about uh, some demonic things that were going on. And I, I began to pray about it and trying to help them discern what was going on, and, and, and I, I knew it was a spirit of fear. And so I was uh, praying about this, and the Lord, just, he began to, this is how, where I got the message. He began to show me, he says, you know, you're thinking about this wrong. I said, what do you mean? What do you mean I'm thinking about it wrong? I mean, I've been taught this all my whole life. What do you mean I'm thinking about it wrong? He says, you're thinking about it wrong. It's a spirit of fear. So how's, it, how's he going to operate? I said, well, I, you know, he's going to come in. He's going to be scary. And so therefore, uh, it gets the person scared. So it's a spirit of fear. He says, no, they put a thought in your mind that causes you to have fear. Then you opened up the door. And now there's a place that he can operate. And I was like, ah, now I see what he's doing. He comes in and puts a thought. Uh, you're going to have cancer. Uh, your husband doesn't love you. Um, you know, any thought that would come into it and make it go, <gasps> and get in fear, therefore, as soon as you grab hold of it, as soon as you operate in it, oh, that's right, what if this happens? As soon as you operate, then he has entrance to come into your life and to just keep setting up camp because you gave it to him. Because you got fearful. And the way he made you fearful was not that he came up, Rawr. It was that he came up and put a fearful thought in you, and you took it. So I want to tell y'all something. All of y'all, I would just, just about imagine, every one of us in here, you know what I'm talking about, and either today you have a spirit of fear operating in your life, speaking to you non-truths of what your future looks like, and so therefore, I'm not saying you're demon-possessed, I'm just saying you open up the door to a spirit of fear, and he's going to keep operating until you stand up and resist him. Until today, the revelation kicks off on the inside of you and you say, I see what you're doing. You're no good for nothing. It's like I always said, trying to lose weight. It's one of the hardest things in the world to do because you're trying to do good. You turn, you're mentally telling yourself you need to stop eating this and that, and you're going to do this, and you're going to stop. Let's just use ice cream because we all love ice cream. And so, so you're sitting there saying, I'm not going to eat any ice cream because it's going to be good. That's better for me. I'm not going to eat any ice cream. And then your body says, oh, I want some ice cream. If you could just feel that 
smooth chocolate omelet spoon running over your tongue. It would bring such satisfaction, and it would be so good in the tasting, and you know you had a hard day, and, and it would make you feel better, and, and it would, you know, just, you know, it won't, I mean, you're just a little bit of ice cream. It wouldn't hurt. And so finally, you give in, and then you fall, and you say, oh my gosh, and you go to the to Dylan, and you get the ice cream out, and you get it. So you get just a little less than you normally would have, because you're still thinking, you know, you're trying to be healthy. So then you eat it, and it tasted so good, and it's made you feel so good, and it satisfied you, and as soon as you're through, then your body says, I can't believe you're not strong enough to withstand the temptation of eating ice cream. I can't believe you did that to me. You're poison to me right now. See, it's a lie from the pit of hell, both ways. Either way you're going, you're sunk. Well, the spirit of fear wants to do the same thing to you. He wants to come into you. He wants to get you thinking a fearful thought. And then you say, that's not going to happen. But do you really believe it? Or are you just being the good Christian, putting on the Christian face and saying, that's not going to happen. My God says, his angels will watch over me and protect me. But inside of you, you don't really believe it. You've just gotten a little bit farther in your walk with Jesus. You've just gotten a little bit farther that you're kind of, you read the word and you heard the preacher say something about it or you saw a devotion about it. And you got a little bit more word in you. So therefore you've got a, you know, you're trying to muster up a little bit more faith, but you truly still don't believe God's going to do anything for you. I wrote this down. This is just me, okay? So don't take this, and I'm not writing a book about it, and my words may even be wrong, but I I wrote that three kinds of faith. There may be 50. I just have three. First one is general faith. General faith is like you believe in God. You go up to somebody and say, do you believe in God? Sure, I believe in God. You go to church? No, I don't go to church. You read your Bible? No, I don't read my Bible. But I believe in God. There's God. Yeah, I believe in God. I'm not an atheist. What do you think I am? Right? It's just general faith. The second one is I'm going to call specific faith. Now you believe in God and you believe God sent Jesus to save you. So therefore you confess him and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But that's the extent of your knowledge. You don't know what he redeemed you from. You don't uh, have any real truth about the Bible. You don't read the Bible. You don't know what the truth is. And so therefore you have this specific faith that you believe in God and you believe in Jesus and you know if you died, you'd go to heaven. If you had a car wreck, you'd go to heaven. You you, you got this. That's the end of it. You have no more faith in that. And then I've got it wrote down. I I call it exact faith. Now you know God has a redemptive work through Jesus that he has given you all the promises and you're trying to now live them. Hello? You're trying to walk it out. You're trying to walk out your faith. And so you're going to find Christians at all three different levels. All right? And I don't know where you are this morning. Everybody out there listening and watching, everybody, everybody in here, I don't know where, you know, where your faith is. In one of, but you're in one of the, probably those three faiths, three places of faith. Now, I want to tell you something. God called you, all of us, when you were born again. The moment you ask Jesus Christ to come into your life and to save you, he placed inside of you a born-again spirit. And that born-again spirit is allergic to doubt and unbelief, allergic to fear. It It isn't supposed to operate in fear. It doesn't know how to operate in fear. It's like buying a diesel truck and trying to make it run on gas. It just ain't going to work. I believe Christians are sick simply because they're not, their system is not supposed to be operating in doubt and unbelief. And they operate in doubt and unbelief. Makes them sick. Are you following me here? God didn't give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a born-again spirit. He gave you a spirit like Jesus. He gave you a, a born-again, washed in the blood of Jesus, Holy Ghost-filled spirit to live on the inside of you that is caused and works by Faith. What is faith? Let's don't get complicated with it. Faith just means it's what do you believe in? So if the devil comes to you and says, you're going to fail, and you say, (laughs) fail? I failed years ago, but then I got Jesus in my life. I don't go down, I go up. You've got faith. If the devil says to you, you're going to fail, and you say, 
Well, I, I don't believe I'm going to fail because the word of God says I'm going to be the head, not the tail. I, I, I'm above and not beneath. I, I, I don't believe I, I don't. No, 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 no. I, I don't really believe I'm going to fail. I believe God, right? All right, right, God. I'm not going to fail, right? I'm not, I'm not really because your word says I'm not going to fail. I'm not going to fail, right? Is that right? Oh, God, I did that the other day. I shouldn't have done that. If I would have done that the other day, well, then, oh, then, I, oh, God, I'm going to fail. See, you're not in faith. You got talked out of it. It's the hardest thing about healing. I know within my heart, listen to me. I know within my heart. I know it. You can't take it from me. Tie me on a wagon wheel and beat me with a rope out there. I'm telling you, I know Jesus is a healer. I know that, 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 that laying on of hands for the sick and, and, and healing is all God's promises. It's all there. I know that by faith, God heals. I know that you can go home and you can pray and by faith, God can heal you. I know it. You're not going to ever change me. You're not going to ever ta- get that away from me, okay? But then I know a lot of people I've prayed for that did not get healed. And so, therefore, the devil wants to always use it on me. And so there's not a person that I pray for that I don't have to go with you and then say, oh, shut up, devil, I ain't listening to you because I know what the Word of God says. I have to wrestle. Listen, I got hit with something that doesn't bear discussing, but I got hit with something a year ago that was really kind of knocked my knees out from under me, and I prayed about it for a year, and just the other day, ba dropped on the inside of me. God says, you won? I said, Phew. and it was just like it was gone, but it took me a year of praying. It took me a year of fighting. Took me a year to get the devil out of my head saying, you know, th- this, that, and the other. Saying you're going to go down, you're going to fail, you're going to be whatever. I mean, for a year that happened to me. So I'm not saying it just comes easy. I'm the preacher and I fought for a year to overcome a major thing. But bless God, I knew I was going to overcome. Amen. You know why? Because I'm too stupid to quit. <laughs> I'm just too hard-headed and I'm just not going to give up on whatever I've read in the Bible. I know it's true. And I, I feel sorry for the person who doesn't know what the Word says. Because I'm going over the word. I got, I got thousands of scriptures in my, written in my phone that I go over and I read them and read them and read them and read them. And read them. That's what the word says and that's what I want in my life. I fight it. But the doubt's there. The thought comes that you're never going to get rid of that. And then some yahoo will say something to me. You know, this, this week's plan is Psalms 1. And Psalms 1 says, you know, be careful who you're walking with. Because about the time you got your faith all built up, then some yo-yo comes up and says something to you, and you're like, thanks a lot, buddy. Right? Or some well-meaning Christian says, oh, I was praying the other day. Ooh, I saw the demon horde of hell coming towards you. Chariots of hell coming at you, coming around here. I'm like, really? I mean, I know that. You don't have to tell me. Tell me you saw a herd of angels flying down, chopping heads off. I mean, bless God, give me something good. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, again, I don't want to just get off on a, my soapbox here, but I, I mean, I listen to so many Christians, you know, and, there, and have you noticed how many prophets there are that say they're prophets and prophesying, but nobody ever prophesies anything good. It's always doom and gloom. Man, I tell you, the world's going to roll up and going to kill you and this is happening, tearing you apart, but at the last breath, Jesus is going to save you. I'm like, man, where's the guy that just prophesies? Man, it's all good. I think it's only me. <laughs> That's why everybody likes to come to church. Because I'm going to tell you the good things of God. I'm going to tell you my God wants to deliver you. I'm telling you today, you're not supposed to operate in fear. Fear is not so severe. He said, but it's just so true. See, he's got you. The worms have eaten a hole in your head. And now you got that. It's down on the inside of you, and you can't see anything but fear. But I'm telling you, you're making yourself sick because God didn't want you to ever operate in fear. You're supposed to be operating in faith. So let's just put this all in perspective. God's sitting up in heaven one day, having a conversation with Jesus, and the devil decided he was going to take over. I'm just giving you what Scripture says. The devil decided he was going to take over. He was a choir boy. Not that there's anything wrong with the choir boy, but I mean, that's what he was. And then he started a big war, which made it about from, I guess, the front door of the throne room to the throne. And it says, Jesus said, I remember the fight. He said, wait, Jesus says, I'm paraphrasing a little here. He said, I remember that fight. Memory came up. And I, I believe I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Yeah. Amen. 
Wasn't even a fight. He just gone. I mean, you talk about that wasn't like there was a one two punch. It was like all the kung fu fighting going around. Oh, yeah, yeah. From one end of the scene to the next, right? I'm just going to man, he thought he was going to win. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. And I want to believe the guy that got defeated, that fell from heaven like lightning, who didn't create, he didn't create any worlds. He just wants to create a world in your brain. Hear what I'm saying? He just wants to create a new world in your brain. That's not the truth. Nobody loves me. That's not right. That is not right. Nobody cares for me. It's not right. It's a lie from the pit of hell. But he wants to create in you a world. And you're living in that world that he's created in your head. And I'm telling you today, it's not the truth. And unless you stand and resist it by taking the truth of God's word in it and destroy that world in your brain, you're not going to walk in victory. You're going to keep being defeated. You're going to keep yielding to the devil. You're going to keep doing what he wants you to do. You develop a rut in your brain so deep you can't get out. And you just keep following that same rut and that same pattern over and over and over again. And that's not your nature. That's not your nature. You're born again believers called to walk in faith. It's not your, it's not your nature. And that's why you're sick. That's why you're worried. That's why your gut hurts. That's why you got problems. That's why you got physical problems and mental problems and spiritual problems because you're trying to operate yourself in fear, not faith. Now, Hebrews 11.6 tells us, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. You're never going to please God without faith. Why would you? Why would you want to attend this church if you didn't believe God called me to be the pastor? Well, beats anything else around there. You know, got good music. I mean, I don't like the guy. I think he's an idiot, but I won't go because got, got good air conditioning and music's pretty good. I mean, you know, you're, you're doing it wrong. If you don't believe in something, then why are you walking in it? Why are you here? It's time for us as Christians to rise up and say, no, I believe in God, the creator of the ends of the earth. They put all the stars in the sky. And I, I believe in the guy that knows their names. I believe in, 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 in the son, in his son, Jesus, he sent for us to redeem us. Who loved me so much that he killed his own son on a cross. And the son loved me so much that he was willing to die on a cross for me. But then God was so powerful that when the devil was jumping and rejoicing, thought he had killed the son of God, sent the Holy Ghost down there. (laughs) Raised him from the dead. Didn't just roll the stone back, blew that sucker off the wall. Stepped out in all of his glory and said, I'm back, boys. You know what? I I, 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 got to tell you all this. This is a little side note. While sitting, I'm embarrassed to say it, but I'll say it. While I was in London, Pastor Wynn insisted that we go to Herod's and have tea. I said, that ain't my style. Pastor Wynn, I don't want to go have tea. He said, well, you can drink coffee. I said, well, that's a little better, but it, just going for tea, it just doesn't sound right. I said, if the people back home find out I was having tea in London, it's just going to hurt my reputation, you know? But we were sitting there talking, and so, you know, a fancy place. Whoo, man, I didn't know what to do. You know, when you get in the, have you ever noticed that when you get in a fancy place, you don't know what to do with your hands? You put them in your lap, and that didn't seem right. You put them in your hand, you're trying to hide, you're trying to get them under the napkin, over the napkin. What do you do with the napkin? You know what? Anyway, 
At least I didn't spill mine, but... <clears throat> Somebody did, but I won't say who. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> Pastor Wynn tells me, hey, so I got this napkin, right? I mean, I've been to restaurants you get a napkin for, you know, but I'm saying, you know, you, you, I got this napkin, and so I'm nervous, and I'm, I'm, I keep folding my napkin, you know, and I fold it up, and then I'm unfolding it, and I'm, I'm just playing with my napkin because I don't know what to do with my hands. Are they supposed to be on the table? Are they not on the table? Do you, you know, how do you do this and whatever? So I'm sitting there just folding my napkin, you know, I'm just keep playing with it. And he starts laughing. He says, man, this is a message to preach right here. He said, did you know under British uh, etiquette that if you're going to leave the table and come back, you fold your napkin just like I was doing and you set it down by your plate. And then if you went to the restroom, come back, and the waiter comes by, and he looks. See, some of y'all are shaking your heads here like you've ever heard this, and so they're a little more refined than I am. And so he says, they come by, and they see it folded, then they know you're going to come back. But if you take the napkin, and you just kind of wad it, you know, you just kind of lift it in a bunch there, they know you're through, and you're leaving. And so Wynn looked at me and says, how did Jesus leave the napkin over his face in the tomb? And I said, whoo, man, I got a message now. I said, he folded it, man. He's coming back. And so I was getting all fired up. Then I was wanting to preach, get on top of the table and shout Jesus, you know. Point being is a revelation. Faith, not fear. What does the world hold for me? Huh, man, I'm going to heaven. If... If I don't go to heaven, he's coming back to get me. I ain't got no fear. What are they going to do? Kill me? Kill me? Well, I'm going to go to heaven. To be absent from this body, so you press the Lord. Oh, thanks. You know, you really scared me there. We'll feed you to the lions. Really? He said, oh, Pastor, this is terrible. You know, you're supposed to live. I, I, I'm going to live forever anyway. I'm going to live forever with all my family anyway. I'm not dying. I'm just going to step off planet Earth and go to heaven. And that you're going to give me fear, devil, over that? You see, folks, you've got to understand, you're operating in faith, not fear. And all the times you've operated in doubt, in fear, it's a disgrace to God. You're saying he can't do it. And I hate to just slap you in the chops, but I'm going to serve you communion here in just a minute and you can get right. But I'm telling you, it's a disgrace to God to say you can't do it. This world system, this evil man, this evil woman, this, this situation is bigger than my God who created the heavens and the earth and all therein. You're telling me God can't get your electric bill paid? He can't come up with 300 bucks when he paves heaven in gold? Well, I just don't know how he could. Just because you don't know how he could doesn't mean he can't. I mean, goodness, you're not God. Quit thinking you are. You're not even the executive secretary to the Holy Ghost. You don't rank real high on suggestion box in heaven. I'm sorry. You've not been around forever. God didn't just show up and say, oh, that's how that works. Oh, okay, I'll make note of that. Angels, make note of that. That's how that works over here. We'll, we'll have to readjust some things in heaven. He's been around forever. He knows what's going on. All he wants us to do is have some faith in him that he can pull it off and do what he promised he could do because he, listen, here's your seal. Here's your seal. That he loved you so much he gave his son for you to die for you. And his son loved you so much that he died for you and rose from the dead. Then that's your promise, your seal 
plus the Holy Ghost, is your seal lined up to say God's promises are true to you if you'll just have faith in them. And I'm not telling you it's not a battle. I'm telling you, I battled for a year until the other day. It dropped right down on the inside of me. And I said, man, it's mine. Thank you, Jesus. But it took me a year of prayer. It's a big deal. Wasn't like I got a hang now and I was trying to get over it. Okay? But I was healed. I mean, boop, dropped in, boop, dropped on the inside of me. That's it. But I want to tell you something. That's faith. Because nobody can take it from me now because I know now. That I won. And you got to resist. So let me ask you today, how many of y'all are willing to resist the devil? Look at the person beside you, kind of give him a little shake and say, are you willing to resist? That's all you got to do. You don't have to defeat. Hear me. You do not have to defeat the devil. He's already defeated. Your job is to resist him. Resist means to stand fast against it. Resist is to tell him to get out, go find somebody else to pick on. No, I don't do that. Just tell him to just get lost. Have mercy for other people. So I know right now, going through your heads, because it's just like, <laughs> that's a bad example. I'll just forget that one. <clears throat> I mean, when you stir a hornet's nest, you know, they, they get agitated. So I know I kind of stirred your worms in your head. And so, you know, uh, uh, you probably got some thoughts running through your head right now saying, about, oh, but what about this? What about this? What about this? You know, and I know it. But I'm just going to believe God. We're going to serve you communion here in a minute. And I want to believe God for the power of the Holy Ghost to take care of it. I can promise you this. You know what? I can promise you this, that when you come here in a minute, and by the way, here at Living Wonders Church, you have an open communion service. You're, everyone that's a believer in Jesus Christ is welcome to have communion with us. But I don't believe that this is just a piece of bread and this is just a piece of uh, 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 some juice in a glass. I do not believe that this, that, that, that's right now sitting on these little silver plates, and, and uh, they're not even silver. <laughs> come to think of it. Silver looking plates. And... Uh, Got the pretty little hanky over that right over there. You may just be looking at it and say, oh, yeah, well, this is a piece of bread and just some juice. I'm telling you, man, there's power in this if you put any faith in it. Because the Bible says people died because they didn't have faith in communion. Go read it. First Corinthians 11. It says people died because they didn't have faith in communion. In other words, through communion, God would have healed them. That's what it says. Read your word. I believe with all of my heart when you come up here in a minute, by faith, right now, if you're willing to repent and hear what I've said today by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and repent for doubt, repent for fear, to resist the devil and come forth and say, Lord, I want to be believing you. I am going to grab hold of the word and the truth of your word, and I'm going to be believing you. And you take communion, I believe God will kill all the worms in your head, give you a fresh start. Now, i got to tell you, tomorrow the devil will call you up on the phone and try to get you backing it out in unbelief. But at least you can get rid of all the worms you got today. You can have a complete eradication die-off today. All the strongholds that he's put in your brain, all the strongholds he's put on your life, all the doubts and unbeliefs can be broken today. I know it. I don't even have to lay hands on you. I know when you take communion today, the power of God can hit you right here at the front of this altar, and he'll deliver you and set you free if you just set your faith in it. Amen. And you'll be able to start over fresh and new, just like taking a chalkboard and a real good eraser, and he erased all that off the chalkboard, and it's a clean slate. But how are you going to fill it tomorrow? It's up to you. I'm going to go on with this message because I've got a whole bunch of other... I've got poverty versus abundance and I've got a whole bunch of other different things I'm going to talk about and keep you on this thing. I'm not going to let you off. So, but right now I just want to deal with this. Your doubts and unbeliefs. Amen. Amen. So let me have my pastoral team, my prayer team come up here this morning. Those of you that are out here listening, those of you that are watching this broadcast, listen to me. I can't serve you communion physically right there, but I can tell you this. Jesus wants to commune with you. 
And wherever you are and whatever you're watching or listening to this broadcast today, I just want you to know Jesus loves you. And he wants to come into your life. He wants to cast out the fears. He wants to set you free and give you place. He will move in your life if you'll give him place. So resist the devil. Draw close to God. And he'll draw close to you. And don't be ashamed. Wherever you are, just call out and grab hold of him. Say, Jesus, come into my life. Set me free. I believe in you. I believe you're the son of God. Forgive me of my sins. And right there where you are, he'll touch you by the spirit of God. For those of you in here in a minute, we've got our prayer team up here. If you today have doubts that you're right with God, you have doubts that you're, you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, we have a prayer team up here to pray for you. Just grab one of them's hand and just tell them, pray for me. If you've got sickness going on or you've got anything going on in your life and you want someone from the prayer team to pray for you, pray. just grab hold of them right here and let them pray for you. The rest of you, listen, get your heart right. And when you come up here, expect a miracle and watch what God can do. Amen. On that night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said, now take and eat. For this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This bread represents all the brokenness in your life. All the things that have happened to you and have tried to break you. This bread represents all the healing that Jesus has for you. So Lord, we thank you for your broken body. That on the cross, Lord, you were broken so that we could be whole. We thank you for it, Lord. And then afterwards, he took the cup and he said, this cup, it's a new covenant that's poured out in my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Folks, it's this cup that causes you to stand in the position of grace to where all of heaven is backing you. All of heaven wants to come into your life because your sins are forgiven and you've been made right with God. He said, any man that would confess me, I'll confess him before my Father in heaven. Any man that would repent of his sins, I will forgive him. That's our new covenant. And Lord, we thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name.